This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Marty Dabrowski. The Island of Dr. Moreau by H. G. Wells. Chapter 7. The Locked Door. The reader will perhaps understand that at first everything was so strange about me and my position was the outcome of such unexpected adventures that I had no discernment of the relative strangeness of this or that thing. I followed the llama up the beach and was overtaken by Montgomery, who asked me not to enter the stone enclosure. I noticed then that the puma in its cage and the pile of packages had been placed outside the entrance to this quadrangle. I turned and saw that the launch had now been unloaded, run out again, and was being beached, and the white-haired man was walking towards us. He addressed Montgomery. And now comes the problem of this uninvited guest. What are we to do with him? He knows something of science, said Montgomery. I'm itching to get to work again, with this new stuff, said the white-haired man, nodding towards the enclosure. His eyes grew brighter. I dare say you are, said Montgomery, in anything but a cordial tone. We can't send him over there, and we can't spare the time to build him a new shanty, and we certainly can't take him into our confidence just yet. I'm in your hands, said I. I had no idea of what he meant by over there. I've been thinking of the same things, Montgomery answered. There's my room with the outer door. That's it, said the elder man promptly, looking at Montgomery, and all three of us went towards the enclosure. I'm sorry to make a mystery, Mr. Prendick, but you'll remember you're uninvited. Our little establishment here contains a secret or so. It's a kind of Bluebeard's chamber, in fact. Nothing very dreadful, really, to a sane man. But just now, as we don't know you, decidedly, said I, I should be a fool to take offense at any want of confidence. He twisted his heavy mouth into a faint smile. He was one of those saturnine people who smile with the corners of the mouth down, and bowed his acknowledgment of my complacence. The main entrance to the enclosure was passed. It was a heavy wooden gate, framed in iron and locked, with the cargo of the launch piled outside it, and at the corner we came to a small doorway I had not previously observed. The white-haired man produced a bundle of keys from the pocket of his greasy blue jacket, opened his door, and entered. His keys, and the elaborate locking up of the place, even while it was still under his eye, struck me as peculiar. I followed him and found myself in a small apartment, plainly but not uncomfortably furnished, and with its inner door, which was slightly ajar, opening into a paved courtyard. This inner door Montgomery at once closed. A hammock was slung across the darker corner of the room, and a small unglazed window defended by an iron bar looked out towards the sea. This, the white-haired man told me, was to be my apartment, and the inner door which, for fear of accidents, he said, he would lock on the other side, was my limit inward. He called my attention to a convenient deck chair before the window, and to an array of old books, chiefly, I found, surgical works and editions of the Latin and Greek classics, languages I cannot read with any comfort, on a shelf near the hammock. He left the room by the outer door, as if to avoid opening the inner one again. We usually have our meals in here, said Montgomery, and then, as if in doubt, went out after the other. Moreau! I heard him call, and for the moment I do not think I noticed. Then, as I handled the books on the shelf, it came up in consciousness. Where had I heard the name of Moreau before? I sat down before the window, took out the biscuits that still remained to me, and ate them with an excellent appetite. Moreau. Through the window I saw one of those unaccountable men in white lugging a packing case along the beach. Presently the window frame hid him. Then I heard a key inserted and turned in the lock behind me. After a while I heard through the locked door the noise of the staghounds that had now been brought up from the beach. They were not barking, but sniffing and growling in a curious fashion. I could hear the rapid patter of their feet and Montgomery's voice soothing them. I was very much impressed by the elaborate secrecy of these two men regarding the contents of the place, and for some time I was thinking of that and of the unaccountable familiarity of the name of Moreau. But so odd is the human memory that I could not then recall that well-known name in its proper connection. From that my thoughts went to the indefinable queerness of the deformed man on the beach. I never saw such a gait, such odd motions as he pulled at the box. I recalled that none of these men had spoken to me, the most of them I had found looking at me at one time or another in a peculiarly furtive manner, quite unlike the frank stare of your unsophisticated savage. 
Indeed, they had all seemed remarkably taciturn, and when they did speak, endowed with very uncanny voices. What was wrong with them? Then I recalled the eyes of Montgomery's ungainly attendant. Just as I was thinking of him, he came in. He was now dressed in white, and carried a little tray with some coffee and boiled vegetables thereon. I could hardly express a shuddering recoil as he came, bending amiably, and placed the tray before me on the table. Then astonishment paralyzed me. Under his stringy black locks I saw his ear. It jumped upon me suddenly close to my face. The man had pointed ears, covered with fine brown fur. "'Your breakfast, sir,' he said. I stared at his face without attempting to answer him. He turned and went towards the door, regarding me oddly over his shoulder. I followed him out with my eyes, and as I did so, by some odd trick of unconscious cerebration, there came surging into my head the phrase, The Moreau Hollows, was it? The Moreau... Ah! It sent my memory back ten years. The Moreau Horrors! The phrase drifted loose on my mind for a moment, and then I saw it in red lettering on a little buff-colored pamphlet, to read which made one shiver and creep. Then I remembered distinctly all about it. That long-forgotten pamphlet came back with startling vividness to my mind. I had been a mere lad then, and Moreau was, I suppose, about fifty, a prominent and masterful physiologist, well known in scientific circles for his extraordinary imagination and his brutal directness in discussion. Was this the same Moreau? He had published some very astonishing facts in connection with the transfusion of blood, and in addition was known to doing valuable work on morbid growths. Then suddenly his career was closed. He had to leave England. A journalist obtained access to his laboratory in the capacity of laboratory assistant with the deliberate intention of making sensational exposures. And by the help of a shocking accident, if it was an accident, his gruesome pamphlet became notorious. On the day of its publication, a wretched dog, flayed and otherwise mutilated, escaped from Moreau's house. It was in the silly season, and a prominent editor, a cousin of the temporary laboratory assistant, appealed to the conscience of the nation. It was not the first time that conscience had turned against the methods of research. The doctor was simply howled out of the country, and maybe that he deserved to be. But I still think that the tepid support of his fellow investigators and his desertion by the great body of scientific workers was a shameful thing. Yet some of his experiments, by the journalist's account, were wantonly cruel. He might perhaps have purchased his social peace by abandoning his investigations, but he apparently preferred the latter, as most men would who have once fallen under the overmastering spell of research. He was unmarried and had indeed nothing but his own interest to consider. I felt convinced that this must be the same man. Everything pointed to it. It dawned upon me to what end the puma and the other animals, which had now been brought with other luggage into the enclosure behind the house, were destined, and a curious faint odor, the halitus of something familiar, an odor that had been in the background of my consciousness hitherto, suddenly came forward into the forefront of my thoughts. It was the antiseptic odor of the dissecting room. I heard the puma growling through the wall, and one of the dogs yelped as though it had been struck. Yet surely, and especially to another scientific man, there was nothing so horrible in vivisection as to account for this secrecy. And by some odd leap in my thoughts, the pointed ears and luminous eyes of Montgomery's attendant came back again before me with the sharpest definition. I stared before me out at the green sea, frothing under a freshening breeze, and let these and other strange memories of the last few days chase one another through my mind. What could it all mean? A locked enclosure on a lonely island, a notorious vivisector, and these crippled and distorted men. End of chapter 7 This is a LibriVox recording, and all LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This reading by Stefan Mobius. The Island of Dr. Moreau, Chapter 8, The Crying of the Puma. Montgomery interrupted my tangle of mystification and suspicion about one o'clock, and his grotesque attendant followed him with a tray bearing bread, some herbs and other eatables, a flask of whiskey, a jug of water and three glasses, and knives. I glanced askance at this strange creature. 
and found him watching me with his queer, restless eyes. Montgomery said he would lunch with me, but that Moreau was too preoccupied with some work to come. Moreau, said I, I know that name. The devil you do, said he. What an ass I was to mention it to you, I might have thought. Anyhow, it will give you an inkling of our mysteries. Whiskey? No thanks, I'm an abstainer. I wish I had been. But it's no use locking the door after the steed is stolen. It was that infernal stuff that led to my coming here. That and a foggy night. I thought myself in luck at the time, when Moreau offered to get me off. It's queer. Montgomery, said I, suddenly, as the outer door closed. Why has your man pointed ears? Damn, he said, over his first mouthful of food. He stared at me for a moment, and then repeated. Pointed ears? Little points to them, said I, as calmly as possible, with a catch in my breath. And a fine black fur at the edges. He helped himself to whiskey and water with great deliberation. I was under the impression that his hair covered his ears. I saw them as he stood by me to put that coffee you sent me on the table, and his eyes shine in the dark. But this time Montgomery had recovered from the surprise of my question. I always thought, he said deliberately, with a certain accentuation of his flavoring of lisp, that there was something the matter with his ears from the way he covered them. What were they like? I was persuaded from his manner that this ignorance was a pretense. Still I could hardly tell the man that I thought him a liar. Pointed, I said, rather small and furry, distinctly furry. But the whole man is one of the strangest beings I have ever set eyes on. A sharp, hoarse cry of animal pain came from the enclosure behind us. Its depth and volume testified to the puma. I saw Montgomery wince. Yes, he said. Where did you pick up the creature? San Francisco. He's an ugly brute, I admit. Half-witted, you know. Can't remember where he came from. But I'm used to him, you know. We both are. How does he strike you? He's unnatural, I said. There's something about him. Don't think me fanciful. But it gives me a nasty little sensation. A tightening of my muscles when he comes near me. It's a touch of the diabolical, in fact. Montgomery had stopped eating while I told him this. Rum, he said. I can't see it. He resumed his meal. I had no idea of it, he said, and masticated. The crew of the Shona must have felt it the same. Made a dead set at the poor devil. You saw the captain? Suddenly the puma howled again, this time more painfully. Montgomery swore under his breath. I had half a mind to attack him about the man on the beach. Then the poor brute within gave vent to a series of short, sharp cries. Your men on the beach, said I. What race are they? Excellent fellows, aren't they? said he, absent-mindedly, knitting his brows as the animal yelled out sharply. I said no more. There was another outcry worse than the former. He looked at me with his dull grey eyes, and then took some more whisky. He tried to draw me into a discussion about alcohol, professing to have saved my life with it. He seemed anxious to lay stress on the fact that I owned my life to him. I answered him distractedly. Presently our meal came to an end. The mishap and monster with the pointed ears cleared the remains away, and Montgomery left me alone in the room again. All the time he had been in a state of ill-concealed irritation at the noise of the vivisected puma. He had spoken of his odd want of nerve and left me to the obvious application. I found myself that the cries were singularly irritating, and they grew in depth and intensity as the afternoon wore on. They were painful at first, but their constant resurgence at last altogether upset my balance. I flung aside a crib of Horace I had been reading, and began to clench my fists, to bite my lips, and to pace the room. Presently I got to stopping my ears with my fingers. 
The emotional appeal of those yells grew upon me steadily, grew at last to such an exquisite expression of suffering that I could stand it in that confined room no longer. I stepped out of the door into the slumberous heat of the late afternoon, and walking past the main entrance, locked again, I noticed, turned the corner of the wall. The crying sounded even louder out of doors. It was as if all the pain in the world had found a voice. Yet, had I known such pain was in the next room, and had it been dumb, I believe, I have thought since I, I could have stood it well enough. It is when suffering finds a voice and sets our nerves quivering that this pity comes troubling us. But in spite of the brilliant sunlight and the green fans of the trees wavering in the soothing sea breeze, the world was a confusion, blurred with drifting black and red phantasms, until I was out of earshot of the house in the checkered wall. End of chapter 8 This is a LibriVox recording, and all LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This reading by Stefan Möbius. The Island of Dr. Moreau, Chapter 9. The Thing in the Forest. I strode through the undergrowth that had closed the ridge behind the house, scarcely heeding whither I went passed on through the shadows of the thick cluster of straight-stemmed trees beyond it, and so presently found myself some way on the other side of the ridge, and descending towards a streamlet that ran through a narrow valley. I paused and listened. The distance I had come, or the intervening masses of thicket, deadened any sound that might be coming from the enclosure. The air was still. Then, with a rustle, a rabbit emerged and went scampering up the slope before me. I hesitated and sat down in the edge of the shade. The place was a pleasant one. The rivulet was hidden by the luxuriant vegetation of the banks, save at one point, where I caught a triangular patch of its glittering water. On the farther side I saw through a bluish haze of a tangle of trees and creepers and above these, again, the luminous blue of the sky. Here and there a splash of white or crimson marked the blooming of some trailing epiphyte. I let my eyes wander over this scene for a while, and then began to turn over in my mind again the strange peculiarities of Montgomery's man. But it was too hard to think elaborately, and presently I fell into a tranquil state midway between dozing and waking. From this I was aroused, after I know not how long, by rustling amidst the greenery on the other side of the steam. For a moment I could see nothing but the waving summits of the ferns and reeds. Then suddenly upon the bank of the stream appeared something. At first I could not distinguish what it was. It bound its round head to the water and began to drink. Then I saw it was a man going on all fours like a beast. He was clothed in bluish cloth, and was of a copper-coloured hue, with black hair. It seemed that grotesque ugliness was an invariable character of these islanders. I could hear the suck of the water at his lips as he drank. I leaned forward to see him better, and a piece of lava detached by my hand went pattering down the slope. He looked up guiltily, and his eyes met mine. Forthwith he scrambled to his feet, and stoop, wiping his clumsy hand across his mouth and regarding me. His legs were scarcely half the length of his body, so staring one another out of countenance, we remained for perhaps the space of a minute. Then, stopping to look back once or twice, he slunk off among the bushes to the right of me, and I heard the swish of the fronds grow faint in the distance and die away. Long after he had disappeared, I remained sitting up staring in the direction of his retreat. My drowsy tranquillity had gone. I was startled by a noise behind me, and turning suddenly saw the flapping white tail of a rabbit vanishing up the slope. I jumped to my feet. The apparition of this grotesque, half-bestial creature had suddenly populated the stillness of the afternoon for me. I looked around me, rather nervously, and regretted that I was unarmed. 
Then I thought that the man I had just seen had been clothed in bluish cloth, had not been naked as a savage would have been, and I tried to persuade myself from the fact that he was, after all, probably a peaceful character, that the dull ferocity of his countenance belied him. Yet I was greatly disturbed at the apparition. I walked to the left along the slope, turning my head about and peering this way and that among the straight stems of the trees. Why should a man go on all fours and drink with his lips? Presently I heard an animal wailing again, and taking it to be the puma, I turned about and walked in a direction diametrically opposite to the sound. This led me down to the stream, across which I stepped and pushed my way up through the undergrowth beyond. I was startled by a great patch of vivid scarlet on the ground, and going up to it found it to be a peculiar fungus, branched and corrugated like a foliaceous lesion, but delicacing into slime at the touch. And then, in the shadow of some luxuriant ferns, I came upon an unpleasant thing. The dead body of a rabbit, covered with shining flies, but still warm and with the head torn off. I stopped aghast at the sight of the scattered blood. Here at last was one visitor to the island disposed of. There were no traces of other violence about it. It looked as though it had been suddenly snatched up and killed. And as I stared at the little furry body came the difficulty of how the thing had been done. The vague dread that had been in my mind since I had seen the inhumane face of the man at the stream grew distincter as I stood there. I began to realize the hardihood of my expedition among these unknown people. The thicket about me became altered to my imagination. Every shadow became something more than a shadow, became an ambush. Every rustle became a threat. Invisible things seemed watching me. I resolved to go back to the enclosure on the beach. I suddenly turned away and thrust myself violently, possibly even frantically, through the bushes, anxious to get a clear space about me again. I stopped, just in time to prevent myself emerging upon an open space. It was a kind of glade in the forest, made by a fall. Seedlings were already starting up the struggle for the vacant space, and beyond, the dense growth of the stems and twining vines and splashes of fungus and flowers closed in again. Before me, squatting together upon the fungoid ruins of a huge fallen tree, and still unaware of my approach, were three grotesque human figures. One was evidently a female, the other two were men. They were naked, save for thwazing of scarlet cloth about the middle, and their skins were of a dull pinkish drab color, such as I had seen in no savages before. They had fat, heavy, chinless faces, retreating foreheads, and a scant, bristly hair upon their heads, I never saw such bestial-looking creatures. They were talking, or at least one of the men was talking to the other two, and all three had been too closely interested to heed the rustling of my approach. They swayed their heads and shoulders from side to side. The speaker's words came thick and sloppy, and though I could hear them distinctly, I could not distinguish what he said. He seemed to me to be reciting some complicated gibberish. Presently his articulation became shriller, and spreading his hands he rose to his feet. At that the others began to gibber in unison, also rising to their feet, spreading their hands and swaying their bodies in rhythm with their chant. I noticed then the abnormal shortness of their legs and their lank, clumsy feet. All three began slowly to circle round, raising and stamping their feet and waving their arms. A kind of tune crept into their rhythmic recitation, and a refrain. Balula. It sounded like. Their eyes began to sparkle, and their ugly faces to brighten, with an expression of strange pleasure. Saliva dripped from their lipless mouths. Suddenly, as I watched their grotesque and unaccountable gesture, I perceived clearly for the first time what it was that had offended me, what had given me the two inconsistent and conflicting impressions of utter strangeness, and yet of the strangest familiarity. The three creatures 
engaged in this mysterious rite were human in shape, and yet human beings with the strangest air about them of some familiar animal. Each of these creatures, despite its human form, its rack of clothing, and the rough humanity of its bodily form, had woven into it, into its movements, into the expression of its countenance, into its whole presence, some irresistible suggestion of a hog, a swinish tint, the unmistakable mark of the beast. I stood overcome by this amazing realization, and then the most horrible questionings came rushing into my mind. They began leaping in the air, first one, then the other, whooping and grunting. Then one slipped, and for a moment was on all fours, to recover indeed forthwith. But that transitory gleam of the true animalism of these monsters was enough. I turned as noiselessly as possible and becoming every now and then rigid with the fear of being discovered, as a branch cracked or a leaf rustled, I pushed back into the bushes. It was long before I grew bolder and dared to move freely. My only idea for the moment was to get away from these fool beings, and I scarcely noticed that I had emerged upon a faint pathway amidst the trees. Then suddenly, traversing a little glade, I saw with an unpleasant start two clumsy legs among the trees walking with noiseless footsteps parallel with my course and perhaps thirty yards away from me the head and upper part of the body were hidden by a tangle of creeper i stopped abruptly hoping the creature did not see me the feet stopped as i did so nervous was i that i controlled an impulse to headlong flight with the utmost difficulty then looking hard I distinguished through the interlacing network the head and body of the brute I had seen drinking. He moved his head. There was an emerald flash in his eye as he glanced at me from the shadow of the trees, a half-luminous color that vanished as he turned his head again. He was motionless for a moment, and then with a noiseless tread began running through the green confusion. In another moment he had vanished behind some bushes. I could not see him but I felt that he had stopped and was watching me again. What on earth was he? Man or beast? What did he want with me? I had no weapon, not even a stick. Flight would be madness. At any rate, the thing, whatever it was, lacked the courage to attack me. Setting my teeth hard, I walked straight towards him. I was anxious not to show the fear that seemed chilling my backbone. I pushed through a tangle of tall, white-flowered bushes and saw him twenty paces beyond, looking over his shoulder at me and hesitating. I advanced a step or two, looking steadfastly into his eyes. "'Who are you?' said I. He tried to meet my gaze. "'No!' he said suddenly, and turning, went bounding away from me through the undergrowth. Then he turned and stared at me again. His eyes shone brightly out of the dusk under the trees. My heart was in my mouth, but I felt my only chance was bluff, and walked steadily towards him. He turned again and vanished into the dusk. Once more, I thought, I caught the glint of his eyes, and that was all. For the first time I realized how the lateness of the hour might affect me. The sun had set some minutes since. The swift dusk of the tropics was already fading out of the eastern sky, and a pioneer moth fluttered silently by my head. Unless I would spend the night among the unknown dangers of the mysterious forest, I must hasten back to the enclosure. The thought of the return to that pain-haunted refuge was extremely disagreeable, but still more so was the idea of being overtaken in the open by darkness and all that darkness might conceal. I gave one more look into the blue shadows that had swallowed up this odd creature, and then retraced my way down the slope towards the stream, going, as I judged, in the direction from which I had come. I walked eagerly, my mind confused with many things, and presently found myself in a level place among scattered trees, the colorless clearness that comes after the sunset flush was darkling. The blue sky above grew momentarily deeper, 
and the little stars, one by one, pierced the attenuated light. The interspaces of the trees, the gaps in the further vegetation that had been hazy blue in the daylight, grew black and mysterious. I pushed on. The color vanished from the world. The treetops rose against the luminous blue sky in inky silhouette, and all below the outline melted into one formless blackness. Presently the trees grew thinner, and the shrubbery undergrowth more abundant. Then there was a desolate space covered with a white sand, and then another expanse of tangled bushes. I did not remember crossing this sand opening before. I began to be tormented by a faint rustling upon my right hand. I thought at first it was fancy, for whenever I stopped there was silence, save for the evening breeze in the treetops. Then when I turned to hurry on again, there was an echo to my footsteps. I turned away from the thickets, keeping to the more open ground, and endeavouring by sudden turns now and then to surprise something in the fact of creeping upon me. I saw nothing. Nevertheless, my sense of another presence grew steadily. I increased my pace, and after some time came to a slight ridge, crossed it, and turned sharply, regarding it steadfastly from the other side. It came out black and clear-cut against the darkling sky. And presently, a shapeless lump heaved up momentarily against the skyline and vanished again. I felt assured now that my tawny-faced antagonist was stalking me once more and coupled with that was another unpleasant realization that I had lost my way. For a time I hurried on, hopelessly perplexed, and pursued by that stealthy approach. Whatever it was, the thing either lacked the courage to attack me, or it was waiting to take me at some disadvantage. I kept studiously to the open. At times I would turn and listen, and presently I had half persuaded myself that my pursuer had abandoned the chase, or was a mere creation of my disordered imagination. Then I heard the sound of the sea. I quickened my footsteps almost into run, and immediately there was a stumble in my rear. I turned suddenly, and stared at the uncertain trees behind me. One black shadow seemed to leap into another. I listened, rigged had heard nothing but the creep of blood in my ears. I thought that my nerves were unstrung, that my imagination was tricking me, and turned resolutely towards the sound of the sea again. In a minute or so, the trees grew thinner, and I emerged upon a bare, low headland running out into the somber water. The night was calm and clear, and the reflection of the growing multitude of the stars shivered in the tranquil heaving of the sea. Some way out, the wash upon an irregular band of reef stone, with a pallid light of its own. Westward, I saw the zodiacal light mingling with the yellow brilliance of the evening star. The coast fell away from me to the east, and westward it was hidden by the shoulder of the cape. Then I recalled the fact that Moreau's beach lay to the west. A twig snapped behind me, and there was a rustle. I turned and stood facing the dark trees. I could see nothing, or else I could see too much. Every dark form in the dimness had its ominous quality, its peculiar suggestion of alert watchfulness. So I stood for perhaps a minute, and then, with an eye to the tree still, turned westwards to cross the headland, and as I moved, one among the lurking shadows moved to follow me. My heart beat quickly. Presently the broad sweep of a bay to the westward became visible, and I halted again. The noiseless shadow halted a dozen yards from me. A little point of light shone on the further bend of the curve, and the grey sweep of the sandy beach lay faint under the starlight. Perhaps two miles away was that little point of light. To get to the beach, I should have to go through the trees where the shadows lurked, and down a bushy slope. I could see the thing rather more distinctly now. It was no animal, for it stood erect, and that I opened my mouth to speak, and found a hoarse flagon choked my voice. I tried again, and shouted, Who is there? There was no answer. 
I advanced a step. The thing did not move, only gathered itself together. My foot struck a stone. That gave me an idea. Without taking my eyes off the black form before me, I stooped and picked up this lump of rock. But at my motion the thing turned abruptly as a dog might have done and slunk obliquely into the further darkness. Then I recalled a schoolboy expedient against big dogs and twisted the rock into my handkerchief and gave this a turn round my wrist. I heard a movement further off amongst the shadows as if the thing was in retreat. Then suddenly my tense excitement gave way. I broke into a profuse perspiration and fell a trembling with my adversary routed and this weapon in my hand. It was some time before I could summon resolution to go down through the trees and bushes upon the flank of the headland to the beach. At last I did it at a run, and as I emerged from the thicket upon the sand I heard some other body coming crashing after me. At that I completely lost my head with fear, and began running along the sand. Forthwith there came the swift patter of soft feet in pursuit. I gave a wild cry, and redoubled my pace. Some dim black things, about three or four times the size of rabbits, went running or hopping up from the beach towards the bushes as I passed. So long as I live I shall remember the terror of that chase. I ran near the water's edge, and heard every now and then the splashes of the feet that gained upon me. Far away, hopelessly far, was the yellow light. All the night about us was black and still. Splash, splash, came the pursuing feet, nearer and nearer. I felt my breath going, for I was quite out of training. It whooped as I drew it, and I felt a pain like a knife at my side. I perceived the thing would come up with me long before I reached the enclosure, and desperate and sobbing for my breath, I wheeled round upon it and struck at it as it came upon me, struck with all my strength. The stone came out of the sling of the handkerchief as I did so. As I turned, the thing which had been running on all fours rose to its feet, and the missile fell fair on its left temple. The skull rung loud and the animal man blundered into me, thrust me back with its hands, and went staggering past me to fell headlong upon the sand with its face in the water, and there it lay still. I could not bring myself to approach that black heap. I left it there, with the water rippling round it under the still stars, and giving it a white berth, pursued my way towards the yellow glow of the house, and presently, with a positive effect of relief, came the pitiful moaning of the puma, a sound that had originally driven me out to explore this mysterious island. At that, though I was faint and horrible fatigued, I gathered together all my strength and began running again towards the light. I thought I heard a voice calling me. End of chapter 9 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Meredith Hughes, Cambridge, Massachusetts. The Island of Dr. Moreau by H. G. Wells. Chapter 10. The Crying of the Man. As I drew near the house, I saw that the light shone from the open door of my room, and then I heard, coming from out the darkness at the side of that orange oblong, the voice of Montgomery, shouting, Prendick! I continued running. Presently I heard him again. I replied by a feeble, Hello! and in another moment had staggered up to him. Where have you been? said he, holding me at arm's length, so that the light from the door fell on my face. We have both been so busy that we forgot about you until about half an hour ago. He led me into the room and sat me down in the deck chair. For a while I was blinded by the light. We did not think you would start to explore this island of ours without telling us, he said. And then, I was afraid, but, what, hello? For my last remaining strength slipped from me, and my head fell forward on my chest. I think he found a certain satisfaction in giving me brandy. 
"'For God's sake,' said I, "'fasten that door.' "'You've been meeting some of our curiosities, eh?' said he. He locked the door and turned to me again. He asked me no questions, but gave me some more brandy and water, and pressed me to eat. I was in a state of collapse. He said something vague about his forgetting to warn me, and asked me briefly when I left the house and what I had seen. I answered him as briefly in fragmentary sentences. "'Tell me what it all means,' said I, in a state bordering on hysterics. "'It's nothing so very dreadful,' said he. "'But I think you have been about enough for one day.' The puma suddenly gave a sharp yell of pain. At that he swore under his breath. "'I'm damned,' said he, "'if this place is not as bad as Gower Street, with its cats.' "'Montgomery,' said I, "'what was that thing that came after me? "'Was it a beast, or was it a man?' "'If you don't sleep to-night,' he said, "'you'll be off your head to-morrow.' I stood up in front of him. "'What was that thing that came after me?' I asked. He looked me squarely in the eyes, and twisted his mouth askew. His eyes, which had seemed animated a minute before, went dull. "'From your account,' said he, "'I'm thinking it was a bogle.' I felt a gust of intense irritation that passed as quickly as it came. I flung myself into the chair again and pressed my hands on my forehead. The puma began again. Montgomery came round behind me and put his hand on my shoulder. "'Look here, Prendick,' he said. "'I had no business to let you drift out into this silly island of ours. "'But it's not so bad as you feel, man. "'Your nerves are worked to rags. "'Let me give you something that will make you sleep. "'That will keep on for hours yet. "'You must simply get to sleep, or I won't answer for it.' "'I did not reply.' I bowed forward and covered my face with my hands. Presently he returned, with a small measure containing a dark liquid. This he gave me. I took it unresistingly, and he helped me into the hammock. When I awoke it was broad day. For a little while I lay flat, staring at the roof above me. The rafters, I observed, were made out of the timbers of a ship. Then I turned my head and saw a meal prepared for me on the table. I perceived that I was hungry, and prepared to clamber out of the hammock which, very politely anticipating my intention, twisted round and deposited me upon all fours on the floor. I got up and sat down before the food. I had a heavy feeling in my head, and only the vaguest memory at first of the things that had happened overnight. The morning breeze blew very pleasantly through the unglazed window, and that and the food contributed to the sense of animal comfort I experienced. Presently the door behind me, the door inward toward the yard of the enclosure, opened. I turned and saw Montgomery's face. "'All right,' said he. "'I'm frightfully busy.' And he shut the door. Afterwards I discovered that he forgot to relock it. Then I recalled the expression of his face the previous night, and with that the memory of all I had experienced reconstructed itself before me. Even as that fear returned to me came a cry from within. But this time it was not the cry of the puma. I put down the mouthful that hesitated upon my lips, and listened. Silence, save for the whisper of the morning breeze. I began to think my ears had deceived me. After a long pause I resumed my meal, but with my ears still vigilant. Presently I heard something else very faint and low. I sat as if frozen in my attitude. Though it was faint and low, it moved me more profoundly than all that I had hitherto heard of the abominations behind the wall. There was no mistake this time in the quality of the dim, broken sounds, no doubt at all of their source, for it was groaning, broken by sobs and gasps of anguish. It was no brute this time. It was a human being in torment. And as I realized this I rose, and in three steps had crossed the room, seized the handle of the door into the yard, and flung it open before me. "'Prendick, man! Stop!' cried Montgomery, intervening. A startled deerhound yelped and snarled. There was blood, I saw, in the sink, brown and some scarlet, and I smelt the peculiar smell of carbolic acid. 
Then, through an open doorway beyond, in the dim light of the shadow, I saw something bound painfully upon a framework, scarred, red, and bandaged. And then, blotting this out, appeared the face of old Moreau, white and terrible. In a moment he had gripped me by the shoulder with a hand that was smeared red, had twisted me off my feet, and flung me headlong back into my own room. He lifted me as though I was a little child. I fell at full length upon the floor, and the door slammed and shut out the passionate intensity of his face. Then I heard the key turn in the lock, and Montgomery's voice in expostulation. "'Ruin the work of a lifetime,' I heard Moreau say. "'He does not understand,' said Montgomery, and other things that were inaudible. "'I can't spare the time yet,' said Moreau. The rest I did not hear. I picked myself up, and stood, trembling, my mind a chaos of the most horrible misgivings. Could the vivisection of men be possible? The question shot like lightning across a tumultuous sky. And suddenly the clouded horror of my mind condensed into a vivid realization of my danger. End of chapter 10